ad maiorem dei gloria, to the greater glory of God. That's the motto associated with St. Ignatius of Loyola and the religious order that he founded, the Society of Jesus. Semper Maior, always more, always greater, is a pithier version of the adage. Both capture the spirit of Ignatius, restless, moving ever onward, unsatisfied with the quality of his relationship with the Lord, always convinced that the divine love could be answered by a more expansive fidelity on his part. His passion to become a dashing courtier, a courageous and celebrated soldier, an advisor to royalty, became under the influence of grace, a passion to serve Christ, all the way, holding nothing back. Though superficially his life might seem of comparatively little moment, in fact, he's had an impact greater and more lasting than that of most of his famous contemporaries, Charles V of Spain, Henry VIII of England, even Martin Luther and John Calvin. He affected this influence first through the establishment of the Jesuit order, which even in Ignatius' lifetime had become a powerful force in Europe and beyond, and which today spans the globe. And second, through his masterpiece, The Spiritual Exercises, which has, for the past five centuries, taught people how to commune with God and to find true freedom. A soldier dedicated to achieving his own glory became a soldier fighting for the glory of God. And that conversion changed the world. You can walk into any Jesuit church and you see everywhere AMDG. Yeah, Ad Maiorum Dei Gloriam, it stands for, which is one of the great models of the Jesuits. And see, what I, I find helpful about that is it, it orders your life. If you say, now I wake up in the morning, what am I about today? And you could say, I'm about my career, I'm about my family, I'm about making money, I'm about finding pleasure, I'm about like just getting through the darn day. Or you can say, no, what I'm about today is giving ever greater glory to God. Then everything else will fit under that uh, aegis. Then how I handle my family responsibilities, my work responsibilities, how I play, how I relate to people, how I engage in friendship will all take on a new tenor if my primary purpose is to give glory to God. So it's a very, it's a very helpful organizing principle. The other part of that, which is really key to Ignatius, is that little maior. They'll call it the, the magis or the maior principle. Always more. So don't read it, I would say, as a sort of obsessive compulsive, like I'm, I'm, not, I'm never good enough. No, it's the excitement of knowing. I can always do more to give God glory. Now, remember the Irenaeus principle, which is the glory of God is a human being fully alive. See, Ignatius would have taken that in naturally. So the more glory I give to God, and every day I can wake up and say, there's more I could do to glorify God with my life and my efforts and, and my friendships and my work. Well, that, that improves my humanity. That makes me more the person I'm supposed to be. So it's not a depressing principle, like, oh my gosh, I'm never measuring up. It's, there's always more that I can do to become the person God wants me to be, which means the best version of myself. So the ad maiorum dei gloriam, I think is a very exciting principle and a great way if you begin your day and say, okay, that's the project today. Give God greater glory in everything I do, everything I say, all my relationships, then your life will, um, will fall into harmonious place.
Inigo de Loyola was born in 1491, the year before Columbus sailed, in the Basque region of far northern Spain, hard by the French border. He was the youngest of 13 children. His parents were minor nobility. Both his mother and father died before Inigo was 16. Around that very impressionable age, he journeyed to Arevalo, where King Ferdinand was holding court. At this center of Spanish politics and culture, the boy became a sort of junior page and soon became entranced by the beautifully dressed and well-mannered people that clustered around the king. After some years at court, the young man conceived the desire to become a soldier and commenced to study the martial arts, sword play, the firing of pistols, and the deft use of the lance and he sought to dress in the dandyish style of the other courtiers by wearing tight-fitting hose, soft leather high boots, a suit of gaudy colors, a jaunty cap, and with his hair worn long and flowing. The very first sentence of his autobiography, written well after his conversion, summed up these first months in Arevalo. He says, I was given over to the vanities of the world and had a great and foolish desire to win fame. In his early 20s, he was arrested in his hometown for, in the words of the official police report, atrocious crimes carried out with premeditation and involving ambush and treachery. What precisely he did remains a mystery, and he got off after a brief imprisonment and a slap on the wrist. But he remains perhaps the only saint who has a formal police record. Still seeking military glory, Inigo joined the army of the Viceroy of Navarre, who was engaged in a war with the French. During a battle at Pamplona, Inigo was seriously wounded in both legs by a cannonball. On the spot, French surgeons set the bones of his right leg, but did so clumsily. So when the young man returned, his own surgeons broke the leg and reset it. But still the bones didn't heal properly, and he was left with an unsightly bump on his leg. Still desiring to look the part of the elegant courtier, he gave the command simply to saw it off. And this they did, of course, without benefit of anesthetic. In his autobiography, Inigo referred to this whole process quite aptly as butchery. During his long convalescence in the summer and autumn of 1521, Inigo endeavored to read in order to pass the time. He loved perusing tales of knights and chivalrous soldiers, but no books of that type were on offer. All that he could find were a life of Christ and tales of well-known saints. As he studied these books, something extraordinary happened. What would usually bore him commenced to fascinate him. He found himself wondering whether he might imitate the exploits of great saints, such as Dominic and Francis. He also discovered that whereas his customary reading excited him at first, but then left him feeling empty and despondent, reading the lives of Jesus and the saints produced a lasting sense of peace. This was the first instance of what he would later call discernment of spirits. Once back on his feet, Inigo determined to abandon his military ambitions and to give himself to Christ and the church. And he resolved to do this in a very 
personal and dramatic way. Thus, he set out for the Benedictine Abbey at Montserrat. There he made a gesture in line with his chivalrous instincts. He stripped off his expensive garments and gave them to a poor beggar. And then he lay his sword and armor at the foot of a statue of the Blessed Mother and kept the entire night in vigil. Soon after this dedication, he made his way to the little town of Manresa, where he took up residence in a cave. There, Inigo gave himself to a year of intense spiritual training. He prayed for hours on end. He fasted. He engaged in intense introspection, trying to uncover the roots of his sin. He let his fingernails and hair grow in an attempt to counteract the vanity that had so marked him in his youth. He passed through periods of terrible spiritual dryness, and at times he even doubted the truth of the faith. Many of the townspeople, spying this odd loner with the unkempt appearance, assumed he was mad. In time, he came to moderate his behavior and to lessen the intensity of his spiritual practices. Yet the Manresa experience was absolutely crucial to Inigo, providing the basis for the spiritual exercises that would eventually become the cornerstone of his interior life and the inspiration for the work of his order. After going through what amounted to a monastic novitiate, Inigo wanted most of all to visit the Holy Land, Christ's own country. And so, sleeping in doorways, living hand to mouth, begging for his food, he found the means to go to Palestine, and there he visited the holy sites. By the way, Jesuit novices to this day, during their novitiate, imitate their master by going on a kind of pilgrimage, where they have to beg and rely upon the kindness of others and the providence of God. Well, failing to secure the permission to stay in the Holy Land, Inigo decided to return home and to serve the church by becoming a priest. To become a priest, he had to study theology. And so after a few stops and starts, he made his way to what had been since the 12th century, the intellectual capital of the Christian world. He made his way to Paris. Though Inigo was nearly 40, he signed up for some elementary classes in Latin rhetoric and grammar. His classmates were young boys, over 20 years his junior. The once proud courtier humbly sat among them for instruction. And through careless handling of a small burst that he had been given, Inigo found himself penniless and was compelled once again to beg. Despite these difficulties, he was able to finish his studies in language and eventually in philosophy and theology, becoming in 1535 a certified master. But even more important than his studies were the friendships that Inigo developed with a number of fellow students at the university including Francis Xavier from Spain and Peter Faber from the Savoie region. These men, it's fair to say, fell under Inigo's spell and under his direction, they followed the spiritual exercises. In August of 1534, the band of brothers ventured to Montmartre 
which at the time stood outside the walls of Paris. There in the crypt of the chapel of Saint-Denis, they vowed to a life of poverty and chastity, and they swore to make pilgrimage to the Holy Land. If they were unable to fulfill that last promise, they resolved to offer themselves in obedience to the Pope, all for the good of souls. The brothers themselves later recognized this as the beginning of the Society of Jesus. Shortly thereafter, Ignatius, the more Latinized version of his name, which he now adopted, sought the formal approval of the Pope. A number of obstacles stood in the way. From the 1520s, when he was first developing and teaching his manner of prayer, Ignatius was under suspicion by the Inquisition. Keep in mind that this was the era of Luther and the Reformation, and there was a general fear of upstart groups, especially those who advocated new forms of spirituality. Ignatius was, in fact, once imprisoned for 17 days while officials investigated his thought. Others objected to the name the little group of unknowns had adopted, the Company of Jesus. Wasn't this just a tad arrogant? There were Benedictines and Franciscans and Dominicans, all named for their respective founders. Who were these men to claim to be uniquely the company of Jesus himself? I find it fascinating that Ignatius won over a number of his detractors, not only through careful presentation of his point of view, but precisely by leading them through the spiritual exercises. Ignatius was ordained to the priesthood in 1537, when he was 46 years old. He waited for over a year before celebrating his first Mass, both because he felt he had to prepare himself for this crucial event in his life, and also because he hoped to do so in the Holy Land. When this proved impossible, he settled for the great Church of St. Mary Major in Rome, which had and has to this day what was believed to be a relic of the crib of Christ. In 1540, Pope Paul III formally approved the Company or Society of Jesus. Paul was a fascinating, indeed, pivotal figure in the life of the church at a time of supreme crisis when Western Christianity was coming apart at the seams, Pope Paul took two decisions that decisively helped to knit things back together. He summoned the Council of Trent and he established the Jesuit order. Trent addressed many of the doctrinal and institutional issues at the heart of the Reformation protest. And the Jesuits, the Pope's loyal soldiers, they were the boots on the ground helping to concretize the formulas of Trent. Ignatius wanted obedience to the Pope to be perhaps the defining mark of his new religious order. He wrote that the obedience of a Jesuit vis-a-vis -vis the Holy Father should be as unresisting as an old man's walking stick or as a cadaver. Ignatius finally resolved to settle in Rome, and there he commenced to give direction to his fast-growing company. Within his own lifetime, the Society of Jesus spread from Rome and Italy to Spain, Portugal, Japan, and the New World. Though he continued to be a man of intense prayer and mystical contemplation, he was also a hard-headed administrator with a soldier's sense of purpose. We have 7,000 letters, all personally signed. 
that he sent to Jesuits all over the world, giving direction and offering encouragement. During these years in Rome, Ignatius labored over the constitutions of his new order. And this work is recognized today as not only a model of clear-headed organization, but also of distinctively Ignatian spirituality. What was he like personally? He stood only about five feet, one inch tall, and he had a slender, ascetic build. He dressed very simply, usually in a threadbare black cassock. The flowing locks of his youth abandoned him relatively early, and in all the portraits we have of him, he's mostly bald. His style was informal. He encouraged everyone to call him Inigo, and he didn't mind being made fun of. They say that one of his young Jesuit charges used to walk behind the master imitating his limp, and that Ignatius played the part of the straight man admirably. He was so devoted in prayer that he couldn't get through the daily office or mass without copious tears. In this, he reminds us a bit of St. Thomas Aquinas. In fact, Ignatius received a dispensation from the office because they felt all this weeping was damaging his eyes. He had a number of vivid mystical experiences in the course of his life. During the Manresa period, by the river Cardoner, he felt a sense of union with God that overwhelmed him. In his own words, I understood and knew many things, both spiritual things and matters of faith. And this was with so great an enlightenment that everything seemed new to me. While on his way to Rome in 1537, Ignatius stopped to pray at a small chapel called La Storta. While he was in contemplation, he experienced a vision of Christ and the Father. Speaking to his son and indicating Ignatius, the Father said, I want you to take this man for your servant. Then the Father said, I shall be propitious to you in Rome. The experience powerfully confirmed that the focus of the new order should be in Rome rather than Jerusalem. A contemporary of Ignatius reported that he saw the master sitting one night on the roof of his residence in Rome gazing up at the silent stars, tears running down his face. And another said that when he heard Ignatius counseling the poor and the wayward, it was, I'm quoting him now, the closest he would get to hearing the tones and spirit of Jesus echoing in a human voice. Ignatius died on July the 31st, 1556. The day before his death, he had asked his secretary to go to St. Peter's and to bring back the Pope's blessing. Not understanding how sick his master was, the man replied, I'll get it tomorrow. There's much work to be done today. When they realized the next morning that he was in his death throes, the secretary raced to St. Peter's, but he returned too late with the blessing. The master was already dead.
How significant was Ignatius's injury to his life? I think it was the turning point, you know, and it's something that a lot of people really struggle with. When something really bad happens, some tragedy in your life, some injury, some terrible trauma, and people say, well, where is God? I mean, how could God let this happen? Well, think of this life, you know. If this man had become what he dreamed of becoming, you know, a great soldier and a courtier, well, who cares? Nobody would remember him today. He would have been this very, very minor player. In fact, now, this thing happens to him, you know, and it looks as though every dream he ever had was shattered. But in fact, God was closing a door and opening an entirely new door that led to this extraordinary spiritual revolution. It, it helps us to see how to read the negative uh, experiences in our lives. When you're right on top of it, you always say, okay, this is just ridiculous, meaningless, hopeless, where is God? But see, God, remember, he's present in all things. God's, God's in all things. And that means in our negative experiences too. He's doing something. And what he's doing, it was very clear in the case of Ignatius, is he was cleaning something out. Think of all these attachments that he had, you know, to his own ego and to his career and to worldly pleasure and so on. All that was, was kind of aggressively knocked out of him so that something new and deeper could emerge. And it happened in this bed right behind me where this, this young man feels one part of his life shattered, but then another one opening up. Um, without that uh, cannonball injury, who would remember Ignatius of Loyola? Not even, not even a, a specialist historian of the period would ever remember him. But in fact, because that door got shut and another one opened up, he's now this great saint from whom graces continue to pour into the world. So how do you read your suffering? That's a really important lesson here. When people find themselves literally on, on a bed of pain and, and going through a shattering experience, okay, I can read it as dumb suffering, or I can say, no, God is in all things, even here. What door is God closing, and what door is God opening? Ignatius had, and it happened right here in this room, he had the grace to see that that transition was happening. And that's why the suffering of his was so important. Unlike, say, the Summa Theologiae of Thomas Aquinas, or the Divine Comedy of Dante, Ignatius's masterpiece, The Spiritual Exercises, is not meant so much to be read as to be done. It is not really a treatise or a work of theology, but rather a manual designed to guide both those who are directing and those who are following Ignatius's program. It grew, as we saw, out of the intensity and concentration of the master's Manresa experience. And thus, it is a radical and deeply challenging document. At the same time, since Ignatius tinkered with the text throughout his life, it reflects a good deal of very practical wisdom and spiritual prudence. And since it has profoundly shaped the minds and hearts of five centuries of Jesuits, who in turn have had a decisive influence on education and culture throughout the world, 
it would be difficult to overestimate its importance. The overall purpose of the exercises is to prepare us to make a decision regarding our vocation or basic direction in life. Though this has to do primarily with the determination whether to marry or become a priest or religious, it can be expanded to include the choice of a career or a job or even a major project. The exercises are meant to be done in the course of 30 intense days, but Ignatius approved shorter versions as well, including the famous eight-day retreat. The exercises are divided into four major sections or weeks, namely the consideration of one's sins, a meditation on the life of Christ up to and including Palm Sunday, a reflection on the passion of the Lord, and finally a contemplation of the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. But the weeks are introduced by what Ignatius calls the principle and foundation. It would behoove us to pay close attention to this cornerstone of Ignatius's thinking. Here's how it begins. Man was created to praise, reverence, and serve God our Lord, and by this means to save his soul. We notice something that has very deep biblical roots and is reiterated by every major figure in the spiritual tradition, namely, but at the heart of the matter is orthodoxy or right praise. Ignatius is insisting that the well-ordered life centers around the worship of God. Once that idea is clear, everything else falls into place. He says, for this it is necessary to make ourselves indifferent to all created things. Indifference here does not denote carelessness or lack of interest. It means detachment. Once I know that God alone is to be worshipped, then I know that nothing else is of final or permanent importance to me. This is why the master can say, we want not health rather than sickness, riches rather than poverty, honor rather than dishonor, long rather than short life. Worshiping God alone, I can be indifferent to wealth, praise, longevity, even life itself. The rest of the exercises is designed to fulfill the requirements of the principle and foundation. Ignatius wants to produce soldiers, willing and able to follow the divine command, whatever it may be. In the course of the first week, we'll be compelled to come to terms both with the beauty of God's love and with those attachments of ours that prevent us from responding completely to that love. This opening move, I think, is of tremendous importance today when the instinct toward self-exoneration is so strong. The 12-step programs, which are grounded in very solid spiritual principles, compel the addict to do a searching moral inventory, to get to the very bottom of his or her dysfunction. Ignatius is inviting us to do much the same in regard to our sin. One feature of the first week I'd like to emphasize is what's known as the consciousness examine. I know that sounds just like examination of conscience, but the practice that Ignatius urges is far deeper and wider than simply looking at our sin. It's an attempt to Look at all the ways that God has been present to us in the course of the day. 
all the ways that he's offered his grace to us. Now, to be sure, we also look at the ways we've resisted that grace when sin or attachment has gotten the better of us. But the overall attitude of the examine is not self-reproach, but gratitude. Nevertheless, when examining our sins, Ignatius urges us to be forthright and unflinching. He wants his retreatant to keep a careful notation of how many times he succumbed to a particular sin throughout the day. I'm quoting here from the exercises. Hour by hour, or period by period, and first as to thoughts, and then as to words, and then as to acts. No easy letting off the hook or self-exculpation here. In the course of the first week, Ignatius asks his retreatant to engage in a series of meditations on sin. First, the sin of the angels. Then the sin of Adam and Eve. And finally, the sin of an anonymous person who went to hell for committing just one mortal sin. He even invites us to see, smell, feel, and taste the horrors of hell. Read the famous section of James Joyce's portrait of the artist as a young man to hear how an Irish Jesuit retreat master terrified the author with his particularly vivid commentary on this part of the exercises. Once again, for Ignatius, the purpose of all this is not to depress the retreatant, but rather to bring him to understand and to feel the quality of sin, the texture of rebellion against God, the loss of friendship with the one who loves us. After these intense spiritual experiences, Ignatius urges the exertant to have a colloquy with the crucified Lord. It might be wise at this point to say a word about this beautiful feature of the exercises because summonses to this kind of experience abound throughout the text. A colloquy is a conversation between friends. So in this context, it means between ourselves and our heavenly friends, the persons of the Trinity, the Blessed Mother, the saints, etc. During a colloquy, we speak but we also listen. So in this first instance, we acknowledge our sin before the crucified Lord. We express our sorrow that they've contributed to his suffering. We ask what we've done to Christ, what we might do for him. But then, having spoken, we listen to hear what the Lord has to say to us. Remember, Ignatius says, a colloquy is made exactly as one friend speaks to another. Having come to terms with our sin, we are now ready for week two, which is an extended meditation on the life of Jesus, from the Annunciation and Nativity up to Palm Sunday. Having realized the problem, we are now meant to immerse ourselves in the solution. The method is, again, the composition of place and the application of the senses. The retreatant should contemplate a scene from the life of Christ through a vivid imagining of the setting. Suppose we're considering the Annunciation to Our Lady. How is the room arranged? Is Mary standing? sitting, kneeling. What does her garment look like? What is the tone of the angel's voice? Or suppose we are praying over the baptism of Christ. Where is Jesus situated? Who is immediately around him? 
What is the quality of the light? What would we see if we were in the crowd? The practice is deeply incarnational in inspiration. It prevents prayer from becoming merely an exercise in abstraction. And it assures that the whole person, body, mind, will, senses, imagination, is involved in the communication with God. It constitutes, I think, one of the greatest gifts that Ignatius gave to the spiritual tradition. One of the most memorable and powerful features of the second week is a contemplation inspired not directly by the scriptures, but by Ignatius' own military experience. It is called a meditation on two standards. Following his customary imaginative method, Ignatius invites the exertion to see and I'm quoting here from the exercises, a great plain comprising the whole region about Jerusalem, where the sovereign commander-in-chief of all the good is Christ our Lord, and another plain about the region of Babylon, where the chief of the enemy is Lucifer. We are to picture the devil on a fiery throne, and in the process of summoning innumerable demons to send on mission to every corner of the world. We are to hear him giving them instruction as to how to seduce human beings with riches, honor, and pride. Then we are to picture Christ, and here I'm quoting right from the exercises, choosing persons, apostles, and disciples, sending them throughout the world to spread his sacred doctrine. Next. We are meant to overhear a speech of the Lord to those whom he has summoned, calling them to lives of poverty, simplicity, and rejection. Finally, we enter into a colloquy with the Blessed Mother, asking her for the grace to enter into Christ's great army. Ignatius' overall point is this, and it's very simple. Whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, we are all involved in a great spiritual combat. What matters above all is associating ourselves with the right army and then doing whatever the commander asks us to do. In order to fight well in the right army, we have to be humble. And this is why Ignatius takes his followers through a meditation on the three degrees of humility. The first degree, requisite for salvation, is that one so subjects himself to the law of God that he would not commit a mortal sin, even if it meant he could become the Lord of all creation or save his life on earth. As Jesus said, it profits a man nothing to gain the whole world and lose his soul. The second degree is more intense. It is the path of indifference, total detachment from wealth or poverty, long life or short life, honor or dishonor. This is the availability of the dutiful soldier, ready to go in any direction the Lord might command. But there is a still greater type of humility, the third degree. This is the willingness to go beyond indifference and actively to choose to be poor with the poor Christ, to be accounted worthless and a fool with the despised Christ insulted with the Christ mocked on the cross. The meditation on the degrees of humility leads rather neatly 
to a consideration of another key aspect of Ignatius' spirituality. You can find it everywhere in the exercises. And that's called the agere contra, Latin for to act against. The idea really is very simple. If you find yourself tempted by one of the key substitutes for God, actively move in the opposite direction. Let's say you're tempted by wealth, then you actively seek the way of poverty. Let's say you're lured by worldly honor, then you actively seek out the lowest place. Let's say you're consumed by pride, well then you actively embrace the way of humility. Long ago, the great philosopher Aristotle said, if a stick is bent in this direction and you want to straighten it out, you've got to bend it back in the other direction. In his Purgatorio, Dante has sinners running in the opposite direction of what they did in life. And so the slothful have to get up and go. The gluttonous are forced to starve. It's this same idea that Ignatius develops under the rubric of the agere contra. During week three of the exercises, one contemplates the passion and death of Jesus. And during week four, one focuses on the resurrection of the Lord. As before, the imaginative method, the composition of place, and the employment of colloquies are central to the meditative process. The entirety of the spiritual exercises is designed, as we saw, to bring a person to the point where she could utterly surrender to the will and purpose of God and be free from inordinate attachment to worldly goods. This is beautifully summed up in a prayer found near the very end of the exercises, a prayer which has taken its name from the first word in the Latin, Sushipe, which means take and receive. The prayer reads, Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all I have and call my own. You have given all to me, to you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. As we learned from St. Thomas Aquinas, God is not a rival to us, not the enemy of our flourishing. Rather, the more we give to God, the more we receive. This idea informs the whole of Ignatius' prayer. He inherited the triplet of memory, understanding, and will from the Augustinian tradition. But what makes the prayer unique to him and distinctively modern is that he commences with liberty. We might say that for moderns, especially in the West, our freedom is what is most important to us what we cling to most tenaciously. How wonderful that Ignatius makes of this most precious possession the first gift to the Lord. Here is the odd and deeply Christian paradox. Only when I give my liberty totally to Christ will I find real freedom.
So the spiritual exercises, uh, for someone to complete them, requires them to do a lot of difficult, um, a lot of difficult work. Why is that important? I mean, first of all, think of all the difficult work we do in other areas of life. So uh, the psychological work that we do sometimes to get ourselves mentally healthy. Look at the physical work people do through diet and exercise. Think of athletes, what they go through. Why wouldn't you go through something comparable when it comes to what's deepest in you? So think of the spiritual not so much as another segment of life, but it means what's deepest most all-enveloping in you. So the spiritual includes the psychological and the physical. Why wouldn't you attend to that part of your life? So the exercises, and I like that word, you know, because we do physical exercises, we do psychological exercises. Why not exercises at this deepest level to determine, you know, who am I? Where am I going? What's the point of my life? What does God want? So I know what the society wants. I know what my family expects. I know what I want, maybe. But see, finally, so what? What does God want me to do? How do I integrate all those other desires into that fundamental desire? See, why wouldn't you take time to do that? That's the most important exercise you could engage in. And see, once you get some of those points clarified, the other ones find their resolution. That's a great thing about, about spiritual clarity. It leads to clarity at other levels of your life. So I think that you, know, you take the time Maybe it's a 30-day, the full exercises, or you know, an eight-day, or what they call the 19th annotation, which is the exercises for um, someone who's leading a busy life. Fine, take the time to clarify your life at this deepest level. I mean, why wouldn't that be a great thing to do? I put the burden of proof on those that would question it. Why is Ignatius of Loyola a pivotal player? First, at a crucial time in the history of the church, when Western Christianity was coming apart, Ignatius established a religious order with the organization, zeal, and military discipline required to meet the challenge. The little band of brothers that he formed in the student dormitories of the University of Paris grew eventually into a religious family that has served the mission of a church across the world for the past five centuries. He was also a man who fell completely in love with Jesus Christ and who endeavored out of that love to give himself away totally. The spiritual exercises are conditioned in every detail by that intense friendship with the Lord. And the text that was designed originally to guide a handful of Ignatius' disciples has set on fire the hearts of some of the greatest saints, mystics, missionaries, teachers, and writers in the history of the church. Ignatius is a pivotal player because he witnessed so radically to the Semper Maior principle. Everything in him was devoted to giving God greater glory.